Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Vancouver and a warm welcome to all of you for joining us today. And uh, we just had an opportunity to come by all the businesses and, uh, and, all the, and listen to all the great work everyone's doing. And it's a pleasure uh, to be joining you today. My name is Parm Baines. I'm the MP for Steveson Richmond East. And I will be the MC for today uh, as the Government of Canada announces our first critical mineral strategy. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are on the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, tsleil peoples, where we are very fortunate to be able to live, work, and play. And friends, I think we can all agree uh, climate change is no longer tomorrow's problem. It's happening now. If, if Canada and the rest of the world hopes to achieve the emissions reduction targets set out in the Paris Agreement, and avoid the worst consequences of climate change, we need to act now. I think we can also agree that in order to achieve the net zero, we need to adopt more low carbon technologies and make no mistake, critical minerals um, have an important role to play in these efforts. In fact, as we will hear today from Canada's Minister of Natural Resources, there's no energy transition without critical minerals. Critical minerals are vital inputs for the booming electric battery market, as well as wind turbines, solar panels, and so many other products that will help fuel the energy <coughs> transition. The government has been very clear. Now is the time to rapidly shift Canada's economy towards solutions that make long-term climate and economic sense. For our families and communities, for our environment, and for our future prosperity, with that, let me invite Canada's Minister of Natural Resources, the Honourable Jonathan Wilkinson, to the podium. Thank you. Merci et bonjour tout le monde. C'est un plaisir d'être ici avec vous aujourd'hui. Thank you very much, Parm, for the introduction, and uh, thanks to everybody for being here today. I want to, in particular, thank Chief Charlene Gale from the first. Nations Major Projects Coalition, who uh, has been an, an enormously important partner for the Government of Canada over the past number of years, uh, and Pierre Graton from the Mining Association of Canada, who uh, came all the way from Australia to, uh, to be with us here today. I also want to thank all the folks who, who came out to, uh, to display uh, some of the work that they are doing, uh, be they uh, companies or uh, nonprofit organizations. It's great to see some of the interesting things that are actually happening in this space. I think we all know why we are here today. It is a big day for Canada, but before I get into the details of today's announcement, let me start by saying that I believe that Canada is uniquely placed to take advantage of the major areas of growth that will be driven by the transition to a low-carbon future. Around the world, financial markets are increasingly pricing climate risk into investment decisions. Smart money is flowing away from assets that are not compatible with a net-zero world and towards opportunities that are. Just as any successful business must be capable of interpreting and reacting to changes in the business environment, countries must also be capable of thoughtful response and action if they are to sustain and to enhance their level of prosperity. It is in this context that Canada can choose to be a leader in the global economic shift, or we can let it happen to us with all of the attendant consequences of being a late mover. As the world moves towards a lower carbon economy, a key question on which we must collectively focus is how to build on Canada's comparative advantages in a manner that will create jobs, economic opportunity, and prosperity across the country. My job, as I see it, is to work with folks across this land to determine how best to utilize the abundance of resources, technology, and expertise that exist within this country and pursue those opportunities that will drive significant job growth and economic growth. Pour rester compétitif au niveau international et stimuler la croissance économique à long terme, nous devons réfléchir aux opportunités économiques tant au niveau sectoriel que régional. Opportunities from a sectoral perspective will come from new products that enable a low-carbon future, such as critical minerals, hydrogen, electric cars and buses, battery technology, renewable energy, low-carbon building products, small modular reactors, and other clean technologies. And regionally, each province has a relatively unique mix of its own natural resources, 
so the economic opportunities available to them and therefore the approaches to a clean energy transition will be different across this country. What we need is a plan that is based on comparative advantage, one that aligns the efforts and resources of all levels of government as well as the private sector, a plan that also respects the rights and the interests of Indigenous peoples. Such a plan must be thoughtful, collaborative and ambitious. It must aim to create wealth and good jobs in every region of this country while ensuring that we achieve our ambitious and our necessary climate goals. Certainly the regional energy and resource tables which I launched here in Vancouver about six months ago are a critical process through which such regional plans and an overarching national plan will be developed. These tables seek to identify the most significant areas of economic opportunity in each province and territory and then to align regulations and permitting processes and bringing to bear the financial resources of both federal and provincial governments to spur growth and create jobs in areas of shared priority in every region of Canada. The result aims to be economic plans at the regional level for the creation of good, well-paying jobs and economic growth. There are now regional tables established in nine provinces and territories and work is currently underway to set up tables in the remaining jurisdictions. While the outcomes of those tables are truly intended to be the product of collaboration and therefore I will not prejudge the ongoing work, there is one thing I think we can all agree on at the outset, which is clean technology must and will be part of the net zero future in Canada and around the world. While technology itself is not a climate plan, any plan that does not include thoughtful consideration of how to develop and how to deploy critical clean technologies is not a serious climate plan. And certainly the federal government has a significant role to play in bringing those technologies to market. And critical to many of these technologies are the raw materials that will enable them, very much including critical minerals. Simply put, there is no energy transition without critical minerals. Pour faire simple, il n'y a pas de transition énergétique sans minéraux critiques. Ils sont les éléments constitutifs de l'économie verte et numérique. Sans minéraux critiques, il n'y a pas de batterie, pas de voitures électriques, pas d'éolien et pas de panneaux solaires. The sun provides the raw energy, but electricity flows through copper. Wind turbines need manganese, platinum and rare earth magnets. Nuclear power requires uranium. Electric vehicles require batteries made with lithium, cobalt and nickel and magnets. Indium and tellurium are integral to solar panel manufacturing. That is why the World Bank forecasts a 500% increase in demand for these elements by 2050. Production of minerals like graphite, lithium and cobalt just to feed the clean energy transition to batteries. Meanwhile, against the backdrop of this skyrocketing demand, emerging geopolitical dynamics are creating other challenges. Western countries are increasingly concerned about being dependent on a small number of non-democratic jurisdictions for critical mineral supply and processing. Canada's European allies have recently experienced the consequences of dependence upon non-like-minded countries for strategic commodities like oil and gas. There is a strong desire to avoid recreating these kinds of vulnerabilities in emerging markets such as critical minerals. It is in this context that the exploration, mining, processing, advanced manufacturing and recycling of critical minerals represents a generational economic opportunity for our country. An opportunity not limited solely to the extraction of resources, but to the processing and refining, to battery production, and the production of finished goods such as electric vehicles. Indeed, somewhat unique, uniquely, this opportunity exists in every region of this country, from coast to coast to coast, and everywhere in between. As the federal government positions Canada to be a clean energy and technology supplier of choice in a low carbon future, our reserves of critical minerals combined with the expertise of Canadian workers and businesses in mining are central to future success in this space. Fortunately, we are starting from a position of strength. Canada is already a global mining leader. We are home to almost half of the world's publicly listed mining and mineral exploration companies with a presence in more than 100 countries and a combined market capitalization of $520 billion. We are already a top global producer of many critical minerals. We're the top, world's top producer for potash, second for uranium, fourth for titanium, aluminum and platinum, and sixth for cobalt and nickel. Canada is also a world leader in ESG standards and practices. 
the Canadian industry advancing important initiatives such as the Mining Association of Canada's Towards Sustainable Mining program. Over the past number of years, this government has worked aggressively to build on these advantages. We have established an evergreen list of 31 minerals we deem to be critical, with a particular focus on a subset of six. These six include lithium, graphite, nickel, cobalt, copper, and rare earth elements. These were selected based on the size of the resource available in Canada, their necessity as inputs for priority domestic supply chains, such as battery and electric vehicles, and for their potential to spur Canadian economic growth. Further, Canada also has a very strong interest in cases where critical minerals are used only partially for domestic manufacturing and domestic consumption, and where there is value to be captured through domestic refining coupled with enhanced exports to our allies. Examples of such priority minerals include vanadium, gallium, titanium, scandium, magnesium, tellurium, zinc, nobium, and germanium, along with potash, uranium, and aluminum. Canada's list of 31 minerals will be reviewed and updated every few years. With respect to financial support, the government has already invested significantly in businesses and workers along the critical minerals value chain and moved swiftly to secure our value chains. This has included investments such as BHP's sustainable potash mine in Saskatchewan and Lion Electric's vehicle assembly plant in Quebec. It uh, actually includes investments that the government has made in Nano One, who is actually here with us today. And it certainly includes some of the recent significant announcements made by my colleague, Minister Champagne, relating to battery manufacturing and electric vehicle production in Canada. On top of all of this, we have recently seen mine approvals of critical minerals. For example, just last week, the federal government approved the Marathon Palladium project in Ontario. These efforts have already resulted in global recognition. Just a few weeks ago, Bloomberg ranked Canada second in its annual global ranking of battery producing countries in what was a validation of the tireless work that officials and folks in the industry have been undertaking for some time. But we have much more to do. The Deputy Prime Minister announced historic federal funding of $3.8 billion to accelerate work in the critical mineral space across the country, and that is why we are all here this morning, as I say, on a very good day for Canada. J'ai le plaisir d'annoncer aujourd'hui le gouvernement du Canada publie sa stratégie globale sur les minéraux essentiels. Cette stratégie, appuyée par près de 4 milliards de dollars dans le budget de 2022, indique la voie à suivre pour que le Canada y a bien un fournisseur mondial de choix pour les minéraux essentiels et les technologies propres et numériques qu'ils permettent. I would say, just as an aside, the $3.8 billion that was allocated in Budget 2022 was allocated in advance of the finalization of this strategy. I would tell you that is a very unusual thing for any federal government to do, and it reflects the importance that we attach to development in this space. This strategy is the result of extensive consultations that have expressed strong support for our approach today. In fact, the strategy itself hews quite closely to the discussion paper which I launched in June, which I think is a testament to the close collaboration we have un undertaken with partners over the past months and years. The strategy identifies a range of activities that will be pursued and underlines key areas to which the federal government will allocate funds. These include $144 million for critical mineral research and development and the deployment of technologies and materials to support critical minerals development for upstream and midstream segments of the value chain, a 30% critical minerals exploration tax for targeted critical minerals, $1.5 billion in the Strategic in uh, Infrastructure Fund to support critical minerals projects with prioritization given to advanced manufacturing, processing, and recycling applications, and $1.5 billion for infrastructure development for critical mineral supply chains with a focus on priority deposits. And there is more. La stratégie répond également par des mesures nouvelles et concrètes aux grandes questions que nous posons depuis six mois, des questions qui portent essentiellement sur la rapidité d'approbation des projets en tenant du monde compte de la consultation et de la participation des autochtones, ainsi que de la durabilité environnementale. I am very pleased to announce today that this strategy sets out a plan to effectively address some of these important matters. Let me be clear, the focus of this strategy will be on expanding this sector, moving things forward expeditiously, all while doing things in the right way. 
With respect to regulatory delays, we must be clear that it cannot take us 12 to 15 years to open a new mine in this country, not if we want to achieve our climate goals and move rapidly through the energy transition. And so we've identified four concrete steps forward. First, we will, access, uh, we will accelerate processes and timelines under existing regulatory regimes by a concierge service that will be housed within the Critical Mineral Center of Excellence within Natural Resources Canada. Secondly, nationally, we are reviewing federal regulations and processes to identify opportunities for more rapidly advancing clean growth projects, including critical minerals, while safeguarding the interests of Canadians, protecting the environments, and respecting the rights of Indigenous peoples. Provincially and territorial, we are working to align regulations and permitting processes between levels of government through the regional energy and resource tables. And internationally, we are working to harmonize relevant regulations with our friends in the United States to ensure a robust North American market and value chains. With respect to Indigenous partnerships, we recognize that not only must Indigenous rights be respected, but Indigenous peoples and communities need to see long-term benefits that flow from resource projects located in their traditional territories. To that end, the earlier discussion paper posed an open question to Indigenous partners as to how they believed they could usefully and substantively benefit from the strategy. The ensuing dialogue resulted in six concrete steps that are outlined in the strategy document and a commitment to an evergreen approach with ongoing, direct, meaningful dialogue. Some of these measures included leveraging Indigenous labour market programs to provide Indigenous skills training and employment support, prioritizing robust, meaningful engagement with Indigenous communities for geoscientific information and research, drawing on traditional knowledge, delivering the $103 million from Budget 22 to advance economic reconciliation through enhanced readiness to meaningfully participate in the natural resources sector, and pursuing the development of a national benefits sharing framework. And finally, on nature protection. We strongly acknowledge the importance of pursuing the extraction of critical minerals in ways that respect nature. And as a result of our extensive consultations, we are committing to what we call a nature forward approach to this strategy. This means that the strategy must be implemented in a way that is compatible with Canada's ambitious nature and biodiversity protection objectives. Overall, this comprehensive approach to the development of critical minerals is uh, a position, we are in a position to seize the generational economic opportunities represented by these minerals. And I should say, as, a, as an aside, we are working on an international basis to ensure respect for environmental um, standards, for labor standards, and the, and the rights of Indigenous peoples are embraced by countries around the world, and I hope to have more to say about that at COP15 on Monday. Je terminerai donc là où j'ai commencé. À travers le monde, les marchés financiers intègrent de plus en plus les risques climatiques dans les décisions d'investissement. L'argent intelligent s'éloigne des actifs qui ne sont pas compatibles avec une transition vers un monde net zéro et se dirige vers des opportunités qui le sont. It is in this context that critical minerals present a generational economic opportunity for this country, and this government is very much focused on seizing that opportunity. The strategy is a roadmap for the creation of wealth and sustainable jobs throughout the value chain in every region of this country, a roadmap to making Canada a clean energy and technology supplier of choice in a net zero world. I certainly very much look forward to working with Indigenous partners, labour groups, provinces and territories, industry and other stakeholders in the implementation of this strategy over the coming years. This is a good day for Canada. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Minister. It is truly a great announcement for Canada. And I have the periodic table flashing before my eyes right now. <laughs> um, next up, I'm going to ask uh, Pierre Grattan, President and CEO of the Mining Association of Canada, to share a few words. Pierre. I'm wearing these socks today that have the critical minerals on them. <laughs> I will get you a pair. I'll get you two pairs if you give one to the Prime Minister. So, hello everyone. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to be with you and to, to say a few words. I want to uh, congratulate the Minister for a forceful, clear, 
thoughtful and ambitious yet realistic strategy. Uh, further, it's a strategy backed by significant financial commitments and the promise of more to come, which makes it real. I believe we are in lockstep with the government on the opportunities and challenges ahead and look forward to collaboration with the government and key partners, including our Indigenous friends, partners and colleagues. Mining has always been at the heart of every major industrial revolution since the Stone Age, even if at times we don't realize it. Our products are essential. This time we are called upon again to help address the greatest existential crisis of our time, climate change, as well as noxious geopolitical threats that challenge the values and way of life Canadians cherish. We will do so responsibly, underpinned by our members' commitments to the mandatory requirements of towards sustainable mining in areas such as biodiversity conservation, indigenous engagement, and climate change. The challenge is big, but we can do this because we aren't starting from ground zero. As the minister said, we have a substantial pan-Canadian mining, smelting, and refining sector, the third largest mining supply sector, skilled labor, fiscal and political stability, and vast resources. And of course, here in BC, very substantial copper interests and a, a very significant uh, refining capacity at trail. Key elements of the value chain are in place, are being filled, and by implementing the strategy, will be expanded, as the Minister said, to the benefit of all Canadians. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. And um, finally, I'd like to invite uh, Chief Charlene Gale from the First Nations Major Projects Coalition to share a few words. Good morning, everyone. I want to recognize that we're on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Salem Tooth Nations. My name is Charlene Gale. I'm Chief of the Fort Nelson First Nation, and I'm Chair of the First Nation Major Projects Coalition. I recently attended COP27 in Egypt, where there were over 44,000 leaders from around the world that came together to address climate change. I can tell you that I saw firsthand the global frenzy that is underway to solve the climate crisis and to make the global transition to clean energy as soon as possible. We know that this energy transition needs increased supply of critical battery minerals to make it possible. And in Canada, which is a signatory of the United Nations Declarations of Rights of Indigenous People, that means every new mine and every new battery mineral processing facility must include meaningful partnership with impacted Indigenous nations. Climate solutions, including battery minerals, are important to us as First Nation people and as stewards of our land. We are being directly impacted by climate change and our ancestors have always taught us that if we take care of the land, the land will take care of us. This is especially true when it comes to First Nations considering something like a mine on their lands. A good example is the approach taken by organizations like Geoscience BC to engage with nations on public open earth science research that can help us be involved and make our own decisions at the very beginning of the critical minerals development process. At the First Nation Major Projects Coalition, we are supporting our member nations who are located across Canada in the transition to net zero. And we appreciate the ongoing and generous support of NRCAN in this effort. Critical battery mineral supply has become a priority for some of our First Nation members who wanna make sure their nation's values and priorities are central to any and all infrastructure projects going forward. It is important to First Nations to be able to negotiate a good deal for their nations with proponents, and the coalition is doing just that. This Canadian critical mineral strategy released today is important to be able to make those deals between industry and First Nations. We know that the details of this strategy are important to our members. In the critical mineral roundtable that the coalition is holding in Vancouver back in October, and another one coming up in Toronto in February, we know from expert input from industry, First Nations and government that these deals and partnerships that underpin them must be done well. 
and with economic reconciliation and respect for First Nations as their driving principles. The Canadian Critical Mineral Strategy mirrors the Coalition's own goals of driving economic reconciliation with Indigenous people through making Indigenous ownership, participation, and direct benefits available to Indigenous nations. We commend those behind this strategy for including those aspects, and we encourage you to go even further. This includes taking measures to ensure that proponents of battery mineral infrastructure approach Indigenous nations in the earliest stages of these projects, and that an option for equity is always part of the proposed critical battery mineral projects on Indigenous lands. Canada is an obvious place to build net zero mines because of our hydroelectric energy sources and the known presence of critical minerals. The key to success in this sector will be finding mineral extraction or processing arrangements with First Nations that include meaningful benefits and free prior and informed consent. Thank you for having me today and thank you for listening. Masi Cho and hi hi. Thank you, Chief Kill. Um, now I'm going to pass the space to Ian Cameron, uh, to our right here, Communications Director for Minister Wilkinson, to moderate the media availability. Morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, we're going to go to questions from the media. We're going to start here in the room, and then there's folks calling in from across the country as well. Uh, we're going to go one question, uh, one follow-up per person, and please identify yourself in your outlet. Ask the speakers uh, know uh, who you are, and you can ask questions, of course, of any of the speakers who are here today. Um, we had some technical issues with the line earlier. I think it was cutting out, but I think we're back online. Uh, donc, uh, bonjour uh, tout le monde. Merci d'être là ce matin. Euh, on va maintenant passer à la période des questions médiatiques. Euh, on va commencer avec les gens qui sont ici dans la salle. Ensuite, on va aller en ligne. Euh, je sais qu'on a eu des, euh, des problèmes de connexion euh, tantôt, mais je crois que c'est réglé maintenant. On va aller avec une question, un suivi chacun. Puis, s'il vous plaît, identifiez euh, euh, votre nom, puis euh, vous êtes avec qui. Donc, euh, we'll start with folks here in the room. I think I see some journalists here. Excellent. And I'll pass you the mic so that folks on the line can hear your question. Nelson Bennett from BIV News. Um, since this uh, strategy is aimed at uh, securing a domestic supply of some of these important minerals, um, if a, a new lithium mine, for example, were to go into production, what, what is to prevent them from selling most or all of the lithium to, say, China, to manufacturers there? I mean, currently, some of the copper produced here in BC, some of it goes to China. I think a lot of it goes to, to Japan and South Korea. But uh, is there anything that would prevent uh, a, a lithium producer or a cobalt producer from selling to certain countries? So I, I would say a couple things. Um, there's there's the, the carrot and then there's the stick. Um, in, in terms of the carrot, we are certainly interested in uh, fostering the development of, um, of processing related uh, industries in this country. And, uh, and so we have set aside money in, in the critical mineral strategy as well as in the strategic investment fund uh, that is in uh, Minister Champagne's bailiwick. Um, to try to actually uh, ensure that those kinds of developments are happening in Canada and of course that are making use of, uh, of minerals that we, from, we produce here. Um, but there's also the case that, you know, part of the critical mineral strategy from an international perspective is about geopolitics. It is about ensuring that not just Canada, but, uh, but democratic countries around the world have access to the resources that they require um, in a manner that does not make them vulnerable in the same way that we saw Germany, for example, become vulnerable to, uh, to pressures from, uh, from Russia. Um, and so in that context, we have made some decisions recently, you would have seen with respect to investments on the part of, of Chinese uh, enterprises that are uh, linked to, uh, to the Chinese government. Um, I would tell you that there is a broader review of foreign investment going on in this country and some of the issues around not simply equity stakes but also off takes are certainly on the table. Um, we need to be consistent in terms of how we do this. That being said, we welcome foreign investment from countries like Australia and the United Kingdom and the United States and others um, in, in a manner that's actually going to promote economic opportunity for Canadians. Um, well, maybe if you could just touch on the, the streamlining the regulatory process. I mean, just one example, the uh, Tosico's Alley mine, Neobium mine here in BC, entered the 
environmental process in 2014, their website says that that project is still in the pre-application stage. So it's eight years. Um, how, how do you streamline things? I, I know you talked about uh, a concierge service within NRCAN, but what, uh, what other ways are there of, of you know, streamlining so the, the processes for permitting? So I think there are a number of ways, and, and I can't comment on the specific example that you used, but I would say that if it entered the process back then, it was actually being done under CIA 2012, which was the previous environmental assessment process. Uh, as you know, we put in place new rules, which we would say are much better rules, to try to ensure that, that projects could move through the environmental assessment more expeditiously, in part because of things like the early planning phase, which we introduced, which engages Indigenous communities in the conversation early on. Um, so I would say, number one, we've done work to try to actually expedite the project. But number two is often com uh, companies uh, who come to the federal level um, are not entirely sure who they should be speaking with and, there's a, and there are different departments involved. The concierge service idea is actually to try to pull that together so that it can be done in a manner that is both faster but also less frustrating for companies. I would say that we are looking internally right now at ways in which we implement the Impact Assessment Act, which has only been around for about a year, in a manner that actually will, uh, again, allow us to be better in terms of expediting things going forward. Again, not cutting corners from an environmental perspective, ensuring that in, there is uh, appropriate Indigenous engagement and respect for rights. But I would also say that often, and mining is a great example of this, um, there are federal processes and then there are provincial processes. And at times, they don't always work that well together. At times, there are um, things that happen uh, consecutively rather that, that could happen concurrently. And so the conversations that we are having with the provinces are, are exactly about how we can do things more collaboratively such that we can actually cut down on the time that is required, not just for the regulatory assessment, but for the permitting process, which often can take the longest. And, that, and some of those reside at the province, and some of those, like in the, in the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, reside at the federal level. So I think there is a lot we can do. Um, and, and I would say that this is not just Canada looking at these issues. The United States is looking at them. Australia is looking at them. Um, and, uh, and we obviously should be looking to try to learn from other jurisdictions that have figured out how to do this a little bit, a little bit faster than we have. Again, doing it in the right way. Uh, Alex Sagan at The Logic here. The strategy mentions regulatory harmonization opportunities with our U.S. partners on mining permitting. The U.S. permitting reform has been stop and go. Is Canada prepared to move forward with its own timeline and approach to permitting? Yes, we are. Um, and and I, I think we want to ensure that we are creating value chains that are actually going to work here. Like, if you think about one of the biggest uses for critical minerals, it's the auto manufacturing sector, which Canada and the United States have had a very open relationship now for many decades. Um, I would so say in, in the context of mining, um, there are many folks who, who, uh, who complain about the length of Canada's regulatory process and the complexity of it, and I'm not, I'm not denying that there's work that needs to be done there. But when I go to the United States, I meet with Secretary Granholm, who is my counterpart in the U.S. government, and she says to me, wow, we admire what Canada is able to do on mining <laughs> because we have so much more difficulty in getting, in getting mining projects approved uh, in a timely way. So we are collaborating with them. We want to try to ensure that we are as lined as much as possible, but we're not going to wait for the United States, no. Uh, the strategy also mentions the need to ensure that development includes measures to mitigate damage to the peatlands. Does this commitment mean the government is not moving forward with the Ring of Fire project in northern Ontario that could impact peatlands? It's a very good question. The Ring of Fire is a particularly challenging um, space, uh, as you rightly point out. Um, there is a lot of that area that is peat and it is a carbon sink. Um, there are also uh, uh, several Indigenous nations that have raised concerns and certainly questions about development in that space. Both of those issues have to be addressed in any um, agreement that, that, uh, that mining in the Ring of Fire is going to proceed. Uh, this is a conversation the federal government is, is having with the Indigenous communities, uh, with the mining companies, but certainly with the province of Ontario. Um, there may be pathways through which you protect the areas that are peat uh, and you find and you protect those ideally on a permanent basis um, and you find spaces where you actually can do mining in a manner that actually is environmentally uh, sensitive. 
but it also is, 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 is the case that there has to be engagement and discussion and, and ultimately um, a path forward with respect to Indigenous communities in, their, in this area. So, you know, there are many proposals for mines in Ontario and in other parts of the country that are far closer to re realization than the Ring of Fire. People get often stuck on the Ring of Fire um, because of some of the potential with respect to minerals. But there is a regional assessment, environmental assessment going on there now. There will then need to be, uh, assuming there's a, a, a project that has been proposed there, which that has not actually happened to date, there has to be an assessment of that. Um, and as I say, there has to be these other conversations that go on. So I, I certainly wouldn't rule it off the table. I think it's very interesting from a mineral deposit perspective, but it has to be done um, through considering some of these legitimate issues, including the peak. Benoît Ferradini, Radio-Canada. Est-ce euh, que vous n'avez pas... Euh, comment est-ce que vous pouvez euh, concurrencer les autres pays alors que le prix de l'exploitation minière dans le Nord est encore parmi les plus élevés au monde Oui, euh, c'est juste que c'est possible que le prix pour les minéraux critiques qui, 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 que nous... Um, nous avons au Canada, mais, mais c'est la même chose avec l'Australie, par, par exemple, uh, qui est un petit peu plus élevé que uh, les minéraux de, de, de la Chine. Oui. Et c'est à cause de, de l'effet que les, le niveau des, des, des protections environnementales, c'est un petit peu plus bas uh, dans les autres pays, pas l'Australie, c'est presque le même que nous. Mais... Um, mais euh, je crois que euh, les pays comme euh, l'Union européenne, euh, les États-Unis et les autres veulent avoir les minéraux critiques qui respectent les, 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 les droits des, des autochtones, qui, euh, qui respectent euh, l'environnement et, euh, et les droits de, de, de travailleurs. Euh, et euh, je vais avoir quelque chose de dire euh, de ça euh, lundi euh, à COP, euh, COP15. Euh, Bien sûr, nous avons les conversations avec nos alliés hein, sur exactement ce sujet. Est-ce que vous ne craignez pas qu'en accélérant les projets miniers, vous sacrifiez l'environnement oh, Il y a beaucoup de, de gens qui pensent ça. Euh, J'étais le, le ministre de l'Environnement. Je, 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 je sais très bien euh, les, les enjeux qu'on doit, euh, doit se considérer. Mais je crois qu'il y a les, les chemins dans lesquels euh, on peut euh, trouver les solutions qui protègent l'environnement au même temps d'avoir les, les projets minéraux critiques. Et comme j'ai dit, nous devons trouver les chemins comme ça. Euh, il n'y a pas une transition énergétique si nous n'avons pas les minéraux critiques euh, et beaucoup plus que, que, que maintenant. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, everybody. We're going to go to uh, calls on the line. I think that's all the journalists in the room. Uh, so, operator, over to you. Thank you. Merci. Please press star one at this time if you have a question. S'il vous plaît, appuyez sur étoile maintenant pour poser une question. Our first question is from uh, Mile Mickey from the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. À vous la parole. Thanks very much, um, Minister. Thanks for uh, taking the question. Um, yeah, just just. Um, couple of things I think I think they're related um, you, you talk about streamlining regulation between provinces and the federal government certainly a lot of people would love to see that um, and um, just in terms of though the quantity of studies that sort of happen on big projects you mentioned the ring of fire I think it's a great example so there's uh, federal studies on the road there's provincial studies on the road there's a regional assessment um, so that's um, seven, I think, on, on one project, and uh, different timelines and um, uh, proponents have asked for um, extensions and everything else. It is, it is a bit of a morass, as you know. Um, how, how, how can you, um, with the changes that you propose today, like how do you see th that process getting quicker in, in, in real time? Could you sort of like walk me through how like in reality that that process could like go faster through through the changes that that you you have in mind sure i mean you you have, have chosen one that is particularly challenging and i think i would caution you a little bit not all of those uh those processes that you talk about actually relate to any particular project so so the road there is uh the proposed road is something that the indigenous communities have 
asked for independent of any mining project and that is a process yeah. that's been ongoing for some time. The regional assessment is a tool that uh, the federal government can use in very specific instances where there are broader concerns on a regional basis including cumulative effects. Um, and, but where a regional assessment um, can also, through its conclusions, expedite the actual project-specific uh, assessments that, that, uh, that would be done. In the Ring of Fire, we do not have a project that has been proposed yet, so it's probably not the best example in terms of how do you actually expedite these things. But I would say that um, on a go-forward basis, with respect to proposals that come forward and enter or are about to enter the environmental assessment process, one of the things that we can do, and this is one of the, 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 the ideas behind the concierge service, is to ensure that proponents are ready to enter the process. I mean, we, we often have proposals that come forward, um, and the environmental assessment folks look at it, and they ask for certain kinds of data, and the company is not prepared to provide the data. They pause the project. It goes back out for a year to do scientific studies, comes back into the process. Um, there, it's also the case that we have to be able to ensure that we are living by the timelines that are embedded in the new environmental assessment process, and we have to ensure that our agencies are, uh, are working in a manner that will be able to meet the commitments that the Government of Canada made when it brought into place this new Environmental Assessment Act. But I would also say that the federal-provincial piece of it is really, really important. I mean, mining is, is the perfect example of that where, you know, many mines get caught in the federal uh, assessment process, but they're also in a provincial process. Um, as I say, there are permitting-related issues that are both federal and provincial, and those permitting processes at the provincial and territorial level are different in every province and territory in this country. The one that is consistent is the federal process. Um, and so this is why we are having these province by province, territory by territory conversations, is that the answers and the solutions are going to be a little bit different in every part of this country. But the common theme is we need to find ways to ensure that we are expediting these projects, but doing so in a manner that is not cutting corners from an environmental perspective and that respects the rights of Indigenous people. Can I ask a follow-on? Sure. Um, well, I mean, I know this is a very simplistic question, but why does there need to be um, federal and provincial? If, if the provincial, if it's the mine or project or road or whatever we're talking about is in, is in the province, and they're doing a very thorough study and they're speaking with Indigenous, and Indigenous in some cases are leading the uh, studies, like why, why does there have to be a federal process? Because this is kind of something the, um, a lot of the companies say is, is unnecessary. Uh, and especially with a sort of broader regional assessment, um, I know you don't like talking about the Ring of Fire, and maybe it's not the best example, but it's certainly current. Um, that regional assessment was ordered in 2020, and I believe that nobody has even agreed on the terms yet, and we're, we're two years in, so it hasn't, hasn't started. So a lot of people say, look, why is there so much different studies going on, and wh why isn't it just left to the provinces or the territories if you know, that's where these projects are actually happening? Well, there, there's a pretty clear answer to that, which is, um, and if you go and look at the Impact Assessment Act, you, you would see exactly kind of how this works. Um, there are triggers, uh, particularly in the context of mining, there are triggers in terms of the size of the projects that reflect the point at which we believe there are significant potential impacts on federal jurisdiction, which would include things like impacts on fish and fish habitat and fish-bearing waters, um, impacts on the rights of indigenous communities, uh, impacts on potential impacts on species at risk. So the federal government is drawn into these projects because of jurisdiction that exists under the Constitution. But what I would say is that um, it is absolutely correct that we need to be aligning the work that we are doing with the provinces. Ideally, there is one project, one assessment. Um, actually, in the case of the regional assessment in Ontario, that is the case. It is being done jointly between the Government of Canada and the Government of Ontario. So. That is exactly the model that we need to be using going forward. There is absolutely no reason why um, the federal government and the province need to conduct independent assessments. We need to ensure that we are closing the gap on that. And there are other tools that, that uh, some provinces may want to avail themselves uh, of going forward. Like in British Columbia, we have substitution agreements with the government of British Columbia 
where the government of British Columbia can actually take the lead um, on, on the process and conduct pieces of it on behalf of the government of Canada, where the government of Canada officials actually provide uh, support and information. No other province has availed itself of that, but British Columbia has, and, and many of the projects here in BC are conducted by the, the, the province of British Columbia. Thank right. you. Um, yeah. Thank you, Merci. Once again, please press star one at this time if you have a question. De nouveau, n'hésitez pas à appuyer sur étoile maintenant si vous avez une question. Our next question is from Blair McBride from the Norton Minor. Please go ahead. À vous la parole. Uh, <clears throat> yes, thank you. Um, so my question is, if let's say I was the CEO of a, a junior company um, exploring for critical minerals in the far north. Um, what would you say should specifically excite me about this strategy? Well, I would say a few things. I mean, I think the tax credit is interesting, um, certainly in the context of, of how you do business. Um, I think that uh, essentially the commitment to actually growing this space and the commitment of funds actually helps exploration companies who ultimately often are, are once they discover, are, are uh, selling to a larger entity to actually develop the project. Doesn't have to be the case, but often that's the case. Um, and I think that, uh, that the development of a broader ecosystem in Canada is going to help those that are doing exploration, those that are doing the early development, those that are actually bringing mines into production, those that actually want to do the processing and refinery uh, of those, and, and those who actually want to take the materials and actually use them in, in products. So, um, you know, this is about cre creating an ecosystem, and ecosystems and, and uh, you know, this whole idea of a cluster strategy is, is it actually feeds on itself. Um, it actually creates, once you, uh, once you really get it going, and in Canada we're lucky, we have a very strong mining industry that exists already, it actually helps to self-generate more and more business as more businesses actually start to work together. Again, Nano One is a good example of that in the work that they are doing with others. Um, thank you for that. So, what what funding specifically could I access, or or what kind of permit streamlining processes that will be made new through this strategy? Um, what what could I tap into that, that might make my operations more attractive and cost effective in the far north? So, uh, I mean, from from a, an exploration perspective, some of the work we're doing on on um, Geological mapping is going to be useful, obviously, for folks that are exploring. Canada has, uh, and Natural Resources Canada has a very, um, very strong capacity, capability in that space. Um, but we are investing more money to do more in terms of trying to ensure that we are fully mapping all, all of the areas of Canada that are interesting from a, from a mining perspective. And that, of course, will be available to companies that are actually interested in, in doing the hard work that comes next. Um, there's a billion and a half dollars in uh, in the funding for infrastructure um, that certainly can include roads or transmission lines in the north that actually can help mines. Uh, I think one of the things that I've heard actually from from the territorial governments I met with both Yukon and NWT earlier this week um, is the desire that they are hearing from mining companies who want to develop these deposits for access to clean energy. I mean, at the end of the day. People are looking at the well-to-wheels carbon that's incorporated in the product. And, uh, and if you're actually using coal in the United States or diesel in the north to, um, to uh, produce the critical minerals, you've got to account for that carbon as part of the end product. Um, so there's a huge desire and a push for the government to actually think about infrastructure that is going to actually facilitate the development of some of these areas where there is a cluster of, of, uh, of minerals that, that can be extracted. So I think that would be very interesting. And then the billion and a half dollars that was put into the Strategic Innovation Fund, um, which is really about catalyzing some of these opportunities. It's actually about uh, providing incentives for companies to actually do those things. And, and that is another area where I think many companies are going to look. Um, as, as, as folks have uh, through the, the Net Zero Accelerator Fund already um, with respect to batteries manufacturing and, and a number of processing related announcements that Minister Champagne has done. Thank you. Merci. I think that was our last question. question. Is from Mo was that? From the Globe and Mail. Oh, sorry. No, I think uh, I think uh, our time is up here in the hotel. Um, but Niall, I will connect with you afterwards. Thank you. 
Um, so, Mr. Baines, back to you. So thank you, everyone. Uh, that concludes uh, the event for the day. Um, all the best to everybody in the industry, and enjoy your day. Thank you. Thank you.